Hey, I'm Seth Payne, former Houston Texans player, and we're going to go over C.J. Stroud's press conference today. I do subtitles for the questions because they're sometimes hard to hear. Big week in the big challenge against the Jaguars this week as the winner takes the division lead is turnovers. The Jaguars defense is really, really good at taking the ball away. CJ is typically awesome at not giving the ball away, but he's done it six times in the last two weeks, four via interception. So I know he talks about that a little bit today, as well as many other things. First question. Jay, what does it mean to you in your first year to have this team find for first place in the division heading into December? Uh, it's a blessing. Um, it's been um, really cool to see our progress from all the way from beginning of the season to now. Um, and now this is all we work for. So um, a lot of work has been put in. Now it's time to go cash in. So um, it's been special to see this to work from little by little, new pieces we've added in and things like that. So um, it, it's been a blessing. I actually, I, I'm glad that CJ's actually seen a little bit of the hard side of it and the good side of it because a lot of times rookies come in and immediately everything's awesome like with quarterbacks typically if a rookie quarterback does well it's with the presence of an awesome awesome defense and a really good rushing attack cj has not had a good rushing attack at all until these last two weeks so he's seen just how hard it is and if like if they can add a genuinely good rushing attack which we'll find out about this week uh to the mix then i think he'll really appreciate oh wow this complimentary football stuff actually really it's something. CJ, when you look back at week three, you got row two when you went to Jacksonville. What do you remember about that game that helped you personally? Um, yeah, that Jacksonville team was we knew were, was a really good team. Um, just had played the Chiefs and played them hard. Um, and at that time, we were just desperate for a win. Really, just wanted to play as hard as we could and um, was able to get a dub. But that wasn't easy. They were, they were a really good team. And we know that um, they're going to even bring it this week, too. So um, it's, it's hard to beat a team twice. So we got to be on our A game, got to execute at a high level um, and handle the things that they do um, and focus on our execution. Um, but, yeah, that team is very solid from D-line and backers to uh, um, DBs to um, people they bring in, they sub. Uh, they're really solid all around on defense and offensively, so we got to be able to, to execute and put points on the board. Okay, so as far as the Jaguars' defense, yeah, a, a genuinely solid rush defense. So the Texans' rushing offense has made progress in the last couple of weeks, but it was against one really atrocious run defense in the Bengals and then in a not-so-great rushing defense last week. So this will be the first big test, obviously, also, there's going to be a question about how exactly Damian Pierce gets worked back into the fold. I think Singletary will still get the majority of the the, the carries. Um, as far as beating a team twice, I think that when a team like the Jaguars lost the way that they did, it's pretty easy for them to find motivation in it. It's not just another loss. That was an embarrassing loss, but it was also because of some huge mistakes by the Jaguars' defense, first and foremost, allowing Tank Dell to get behind the secondary multiple times. One time just by making a mental error in which Tank Dell was uncovered. Like, Tank Dell's not going to ambush anybody like that. Now, the, the league is on notice as to how difficult it is to, to handle Tank Dell. The other is, look, special teams. The Jaguars special teams had a fullback. From a Texan standpoint, I don't think the uh, the players would be under any illusion that that game wasn't as much of a blowout on a down-by-down -down basis, as it might appear. You had a really incredible play out of Will Anderson with a blocked field goal. That made a big difference. Then you had that kickoff return. These are two teams that are, are, are much different teams than they were in week three. Last week, Tank said that there really is no wide receiver one when they're out on the field. You throw the ball to who's ever open. How did you develop that attribute? And when did you know that you were good at that? Uh, honestly, that's a great question. I haven't really thought about <laughs> how, when I started doing that. Probably... Honestly, like growing up, like playing in the street, <laughs> just kind of whoever was open was gonna get the ball. So um, I don't know. I just I like to I like to feed my guys. that put in work um, every week, and I see it physically. You know, um, I get to see them work the tail off from the morning all the way until we leave here, and then on top of that, dudes are watching film at home. So man, I, I take pride in um, getting guys paid and and, and um, making them feel their worth. You know, on the field. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I've probably been thinking like that since probably like high school. 
um, guys wanting to get scholarships and stuff like that, my friends. These are my best friends at the time, so it probably even meant more, uh, you know. So, um, and just like I cared then, I care about that now. So um, it's really cool to see every week somebody doing really well. Uh, you know, it's like, is he talking about that? I can't help but I watched some parody earlier about alpha males and how, uh, like, honestly, like the actual alpha males are guys that talk like that. You know, guys that are very concerned about the the people that are in their group. And one of the reasons that they have power and maintain power is because they do right by the people who are underneath them, uh, you know, as opposed to, you know, taking a boatload of Diana ball and uh, acting like the biggest douchebag on earth. That's those are people that like the guys, the guys that want to proclaim themselves alpha, typically not the best alphas. Like CJ's got the right idea there in terms of leadership and that like, I, I feel like he's really got the idea of servant leadership. Like he wants to, he wants to blow all these guys up. He'd be an awesome record producer. Uh, he'd be an awesome mob boss. Cause I think he recognizes guys for the earners that they are tank Dell right now is, uh, is one of his best capos. Tank Dell can earn and earn and earn. Nico Collins, he's an earner. Dalton Schultz, earner. He's got five earners on his squad that are either going to be running their own crews or have more than 50 receptions this year, whichever way you want to take that. So, like, that part of it, his his ability to distribute the ball, I think the other guy that deserves credit is Ryan Day because after years of hearing about how Ryan Day's offense doesn't get guys ready for the NFL, you got to recognize that, look, the offense is going to do what the quarterback is capable of doing. And with CJ, that offense was doing a lot of things that were way more advanced than people wanted to give it credit for. We talked about this a bunch of times, but um, yeah, like it's not like all of a sudden he discovered the ability to be a point guard. That goes back to both high school football and basketball. How much pride do you have in watching him be one of the programs by actually be a good blocker despite a lot of his passing? It's not about your size. It's not about I, like if I was a GM or like a person recruiting somebody or something. I honestly like, of course, it plays a factor a little bit, but I would say how hard they play. And you you turn on Tank's film all the way since college. He plays really hard. Um, I think that is a testament to who he is as a person. And then that whole room, they've bought into our blocking scheme. It's not easy, you know. It's like it may look like they just go block somebody, but now it's, it's they got to read people just like the def- uh, just like our offensive line does. They have to ID, get the ID, and work from there. Um, and Mitch shows up constantly as well, blocking guys. He does a great job. Rob, Noah, Nico. Um, they all really have body and Hutch comes in and does a great job. So uh, we all have a job that we want to do to see each other eat. So I think that's where like Tank Tank comes really big in that. Okay, I I heard Daniel Jeremiah earlier this week, former NFL scout on NFL.com, uh, uh, talking about how size doesn't matter nearly as much as it used to with wide receivers and that now he looks at it almost as more of a tiebreaker. So if you got a guy like Tank Dell and then you got another guy who's similar but bigger than the tiebreaker is going to go to the big guy. I I don't know if I don't know if that's possible because I don't know if it's like I don't know if the laws of physics would allow a bigger guy to move the way Tank does. Like uh, like Clint Sterner said, he he makes some of his cuts like a squirrel. You know, <laughs> he's just almost like he's turning at angles that don't physically make sense, and I don't know if bigger guys could necessarily do that. So I don't know if it's as much about a tiebreaker between two individuals as much as, okay, like Bobby Sloak has talked about, having diversity on your staff. All right, look, we've already got a a bigger guy. Let's get a Tank Dell. Or likewise, man, you know, if another Tank Dell type of prospect is available in the draft this year, they might say, all right, you know what, we already have our Tank Dell. We're going to go with somebody else. And I think there's a lot less of thinking about, okay, hey, this is my A number one receiver, and he's got to look like the prototype. He's got to look like Andre Johnson. More than more now, it's you're putting together a basketball team. We have five guys who can all do it different ways. As far as the run blocking that, yeah, Tank Dell is awesome because he is a scrappy little SOB that's going to go. He's a kneecap biter, right? Dan Campbell would love him because he's gonna. He, you might knock him down, but he's gonna get up and he's gonna bite one kneecap, then another one, and then all that. Um, but I think all of those guys as a group are very, very scrappy. They love to get after it. The thing that's really changed, one of the big things that's changed in the run game is the receivers have been willing blockers the entire season, but they didn't always know what they were doing. You know, they didn't understand really without thinking about it what their responsibilities were or shifting and changing as the defense shifted and changed. And I think what CJ is mentioning there, IDing 
different uh, different coverages and different looks and fronts and whatnot. They're a lot better at that now. So you're getting fewer missed blocks. Same thing with the offensive line. That part of it's been really cool to see. You mentioned how you wanted to see the RG Stadium and get more and more fans in. Uh, what has it been like over these last couple of weeks for you just to see more and more fans just to come behind this team and support you guys? Yeah, it's been cool. Um, it's been every week. It seems like we get more and more. Um, and I hope to see it packed at some point this year. Uh, we'll see if that we can make that happen. But, but yeah, I definitely feel like once we definitely next year when we get some primetime games that happen and things like that. But um, even like if people aren't busy or whatever, um, and I'm talking because I've been seeing a couple of people say the tickets are a little pricey or whatever. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm going to try to talk to some people to help everybody out. So uh, we can make it and um, I'll probably try to donate some tickets out to people um, as the years go on so people can come and support because that means a lot to the team and brings energy, you know. So um, hopefully we can get this thing packed every game at some point in my career as I'm here, you know. So uh, I think that will be really cool. Were there empty seats? Yes. Um, but I think that, like, this fan base has been through some turmoil over the last couple of years. Well, at the same time, the Astros were a very, very desirable option. And, like, that has consequences. I don't think it's an immediate all of a sudden, oh, hey, we really like CJ Stroud. Now I'm going to change my plans this weekend. But I, it'll build. It'll keep building. It's and especially this this week versus Trevor Lawrence, you know, We'll talk about Trevor Lawrence as the week goes on. I think that the the possibility and potential for Trevor Lawrence and C.J. Stroud to be butting heads twice a year and both of them be awesome young quarterbacks in the league, that's pretty rare. That's very rare, you know, outside of like Jim Kelly and Dan Marino and maybe another couple instances, it's rare for two premier quarterbacks to be in the same division. So if that is what ends up happening, it's uh, it'll suck at times. For both fan bases, but it's going to be awesome in the long run. I'll keep that between me. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just, oh, I like that personal stuff. I'm gonna have a good time for Thanksgiving. Appreciate that though. I know one thing about CJ and his dining is that going back to college, he has teammates over almost every day for dinner, lunch, whatever. He feeds teammates. Uh, he he dines with teammates frequently. I would not be surprised if he has like a, a big get together, especially for the single guys. It's always nice when the you know CJ is not married with a family or whatever, but it is always nice at Thanksgiving when the older married guys with families have the young single guys over on Thanksgiving. That usually guys kind of feel that out and try to be sure that none of the young single guys are alone on Thanksgiving. I remember my rookie year, Brian Barker and his wife had me over with a couple other rookies. It was really nice. Remember, Brian Barker was the guy that punted until he was like 45, had his face smashed in in a, in a Thanksgiving game once. Because I, yeah, poor Brian. He's doing fine now. He's fine. Oh uh, no! I mean, everybody kind of simp- everybody gets a lot of like a lot of different coverages and looks. Um, I don't think anybody like we haven't got a team that really travels yet. Um, from when, if whoever you would consider our number one, um, but every I think you can see on the film they kind of have to play honest because you can get got by anybody on our on our offense. You know, our running backs, our tight ends, our um, our receivers, our run- you know what I mean. So like. Um, you kind of have to play as honest, and um, we've seen some really great defenses do that, and we were able to move the ball well and things like that, and it's not easy, you know. So um, it's going to be even tar- harder this week going against a team twice. So uh, we'll, we got to go. We got to uh, work hard with, uh, in, this pr- in this practice week. Uh, we can't take Thanksgiving off or nothing. We got we to gotta be able to work, you know. So um, it's going to be a challenge, and we got to be able to, to, to step up to the plate and take that challenge. Yeah, so again, I think kind of speaking to the diversity of that wide receiving group, that on any given day, it might be uh, Tank Dell. It might be Noah Brown, two consecutive weeks, going for over 300 yards over the course of two weeks. It might be Nico Collins, obviously. It might be Dalton Schultz. Who did I miss? feels like I only said four guys when there are five guys that are on pace for over 50 receptions this season. It's a it's a diverse group of guys with different skill sets. And if you try to bracket one or travel with your best cornerback with one, I, they've got different ways to make you pay. So that part of it is good. Can you tell us what your favorite Thanksgiving foods are? Um, Yeah, I like mac and cheese. That's probably my favorite. I like honey ham. 
yams, greens. I don't know. I, I don't like stuffing or like stuff like that though. I like I like kind of like the soul food side of it. But I don't know. I, I don't know. I, whatever my mom put on my plate, <laughs> she knows what I like. <laughs> Is stuffing not soul food and or dressing? Damn. Other than the stuffing take, I feel like he stayed away from polarizing topics like sweet potato pie versus pumpkin pie, cranberry sauce. Why is it called sauce? All that stuff. What's the deal with cranberry sauce? CJ, is there a discernible difference between what you've seen from the Jaguar defense from week three to now watching them take? Um, I, from the get, I mean, honestly, they they've done a lot since um I put on film on week three. Uh, I do have every coverage, I have every blitz, I have every uh, defensive front. Like they do a lot of things, so um, it's going to be really hard again. Uh, another great challenge for us. So um, I'm excited for it, and, and um, I know that that Jaguars team's going to play tough. They want to come here and, and, and uh, beat us because we got them. So um, we definitely got to be able to be on our A game. But they do a lot, so we got to just be honing our execution. Our oh, how rude! Not of you, CJ. Whoever cut this up, they just they cut it right off. It's a very good Jaguars defense. They are a stout run defense. So this newly discovered and hopefully rejuvenated even further with the addition of Damian Pierce. We'll see exactly what version of Damian Pierce we get with this revitalized offensive line. But it's going to be a test for the Texans. And this Jaguars defense, very, very opportunistic. CJ's turned the ball over a few times in the last couple of weeks. I don't think it's because he's doing anything that's fundamentally or foundationally wrong. But... It's going to sharpen his focus, hopefully, that much more before facing a defense that is very, very opportunistic. I'm Seth Payne, played 10 years in the NFL, played five years for the Houston Texans. I do sports radio in Houston on Sports Radio 610 from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every weekday. I do a pregame show before the game on Sports Radio 610. Great way to tune in and get all up to speed on the matchup. And to Jaguars fans, look. The, I apologize that you came here through the algorithm and you thought, hey, former Jaguars player, Seth Payne, I, I live and work in Houston and I cover the Texans now. Jacksonville booted me out of town in the expansion draft. Don't get mad at me. I'm the rejected one here.